<laughs> All righty. Now let's get on to Kyphus Kane. The last... No, wait. Not the last ditch. We're now on The Greater Good. Written by Sandy Mitchell. Editorial note. This last extract from the memoirs of Kyphus Kane is of interest in several respects, not least in the insights it gives into the workings of the Tao diplomacy, a weapon in their arsenal, at least as potent as the cadre of battle suits, if rather less liable to make a mess of the carpet. Although the Tao Empire is currently cooperating with the Imperium in a joint campaign against the Tyranid High Fleets, they can hardly be considered reliable, given their notorious optonorium and their obsessive pursuit of the so-called greater good. Which, lets us be clear, would be rather more accurately translated into Gothic as the greater good of the Tau, and the warp take the rest. I leave drawing any parallels with our own attitude towards your engagement to those more cynical than I. Which brings us back to Cain, who, if not instrumental into forging the pact, undoubtedly played a major role in preventing its premature dissolution, which would have been to the ruination of us all. His motives for doing so were, of course, entirely personal, at least by his own account. As ever, I leave it to the reader, to, well, listener in this case, to weigh how far he may have taken this uh, his word. As has become of my habit over the preceding volumes, I have left his narrative as close to how I found it as possible, doing little more than breaking it down into chapters for ease of reading and listening. And adducing, uh, inserting additional explanatory material whenever required to educate the occasional obscure reference or provide the reader or provide the wider context generally lacking in his woefully self-centered accounts of events. Ambly Vale, Ordo Zenos. Chapter 1 Say what you like about the Tao, and I've said plenty myself over the years. They know how to put on a good war. In fact, if you ask me, they... They were making rather too good of a job at it. In the closing phases of the Quad Revilla campaign, I've been expecting a hard fight, having butted heads with the little blue blighters on more than one occasion. But they were giving us a lot worse than that. By the time I arrived in the capital, dodging plasma bolts every foot of the way, our defenses were crumbling all over the planet, and it was clearly only a matter of time before they overran the last remaining Imperial Enclave altogether. Quadrinvilia cannot be allowed to fall, General Braddock insisted, in flat-out conversation of what everyone crowded into the command bunker beneath what was left of the local guard garrison, already knew to be inevitable. The verbal glow in the depths of his slate-gray eyes making the unhealthy pillar of his skin even more noticeable. He could only substitute recalf and stims for sleep for so long. The time to redress and balance in his case was well and truly past. He raised his voice over the distant rumble of exploding ordnance, which to my distinct and well-concealed alarm was notably louder than it had been that morning. As if to underline the fact, dust motes jar from some races near the ceiling trembled lazily in the shafts of settling sunlight, sneaking in through the firing slits. If it does, the entire subsector goes with it, which is why the tower had struck at Quartavilla in the first place. Of course, in 
Its position at the nexus is several warp routes, making it natural conduit for Imperial military transports on the way to prop up the steadily eroding buffer zone between two powers. That may be overstating the case a little, I said, brushing my sleeve a few specks which had settled there, and trying not to sound as if retreat was the best option I could think of by a long way. But the general is quite correct in considering the reformations of the orderly withdrawal, which were more than likely to include a firing squad of for cowardice and incompetence. At least so far as he was concerned. Hardly fair, given that he'd hung on grimly in the face of overwhelming odds for months. But someone would have to take the blame for the fiasco. And it certainly wasn't going to be the morons from the Midorum who'd sent the guard in under strength and under-equipped in the first place. You think we should pull out? One of the senior officers asked, spotting a potential lifeline. If the celebrated Kaifus Kane recommended turning tail, they could hardly be blamed for following my advice. That was what Kamazars were supposed to be for, after all. Considering the wider picture. I'd be on the first shuttle, I said, completely truthfully, and just enough of a smile to make them think I was only joking. But as General Braddock has pointed out, that isn't, unfortunately, an option. Not because I was having an uncharacteristic rush of noble self-sacrifice to the head. You understand, but... Because every time anything larger than a server skull taken to the air would be shot down by the tower before it even had time to clear the pad, and we didn't have anything left in orbit capable of making warp in any case. As if to underline my words, and because the Emperor sometimes shows a taste for dramatic, as well as a nasty sense of humor, a faint tremor shook the command bunker, Another rain of dust pattered off the peak of my cap. Reinforcements are on the way, Braddock said, in a tone of a man who hopes to make it true by saying so with sufficient conviction. And I nodded. They were certainly due to be dispatched. I agreed, clinging to the faint shred of hope for even more tightly than the general. I'd been assured that, just prior to my own departure aboard the small relief flotilla, which had arrived about six weeks before, and which my old dining companion, Lord General Zaven, had hoped would prove sufficient to bolster our defenses, until he could pull a large enough task force together to raise the siege and send the tower scuttling for home. And so it would have done if the Tau hadn't had the same idea, that is, and sent a relieving force of their own to match it. On the plus side, I suppose, we had managed to deprive the Xenos of the easy victory they hoped for, and would undoubtedly have seized by now if the extra division of Catachans I'd arrived with hadn't provided so tenacious. But from where I was sitting in, it looked uncomfortably as though we'd managed to do was delay the inevitable. I was sure Zevin was doing his best to get a proper relief force together, but the Tyranid High Fleets had been striking ever deeper into the heart of the Imperium over the past few years, and all too many of our resources were being diverted to contain them. The promised reinforcements would take months to arrive, if they even got here at all. Then we hang on, Braddock said, his shoulders slumping with weary resolution. At odds with the sharp creases of his typically ornate Mordian tunic, and I nodded soberly. I don't see that for any other choice. I agreed. All too cautious of the irony. The thing was, you see, that I needn't even have been there in the first place. 
My current position, Commissar Lizian Officer to the Lord General Staff, had left me in a position to pick and choose my assignments to the far greater extent than I'd ever dreamed of possible in the earlier stages of my long and inglorious career. Were circumstance to the long arm of the commissariat and had kept shoving me into harm's way despite my best efforts to let it gallop past unimpeded. Of course, my entirely intimated reputation for dauntless courage and flamboyant daring do meant that I was hardly in the position to follow my natural inclination to remain indefinitely on Cronovis, watching my aide Jürgen deal with most of the paperwork passing through my office while I wondered how soon I would slope off for lunch. Maintaining it meant showing my face at the front line from time to time to encourage the troops and remind Zafin how lucky he was to have me around, while keeping me as far away from the enemy as possible in the process. Now, with this in mind, a quick jaunt to Quarantilia had seemed just a ticket. As I said, we expected the relief flotilla I'd hitched a ride with to tip the balance of the war there decisively in our favor. So I should have been able to keep out of trouble without too much difficulty once we'd arrived. More to the point, it would keep me comfortably out of the way of the encroaching high fleets. I have no desire to end up as a blob of goo in the reclamation pool somewhere, which seemed all too likely if someone decided they needed the hero of the Imperium around to keep the troops steady in the face of so many scuttling horrors. So, making myself scarce, while on high command, drew up the plans for the latest attempts to contain the Tyranid Menace, was only prudent. To cut a long and dismal story short, we arrived in good order and disembarked by a dropship, an orbital slide of the transport facilities having failed to survive the first Tau onslaught. We were... Harried a bit on the way down, of course, but the Navy had enough fighters still in the air to keep most of the fleas off our backs, and we took only a few losses, digging in around the planetary capital for the most part. Braddock and his Mordians were delighted to see us, especially once our first counterattack had thrown back the enemy forces to the outer hab ring. After the first week or so, it really looked as if we had the Xenos on the run, although I was a seasoned enough campaigner to realize that the reclaiming the entire world would be a long and endurious process. So much the better, I thought, envisioning a long spell, comfortably behind the firing line, while Zaphon and the Navy got ready to tackle the Nids, and with any luck, I could spin things out of here long enough to get back to Cronovus, well after the departure. So the appearance in orbit a fortnight later of a fleet of Tau, um, merchantmen, came to us a petty unpleasant surprise. By luck or base cunning, probably by the letter, knowing them, they popped into the system a couple of days after the Imperial Flotilla had left for Coronavus, and had a clear run of the planet, the gunboats of the SDF having been swept from the sky in the course of the first incursion, all of which left me without a proverbial paddle. I wasn't dead yet, though and I'd been in tighter spots than this before now, so I dispensed a few encouraging platitudes, bade everyone in the bunker good night, and withdrew, oppositely to go and make sure the troopers on our perimeter were keeping up to the mark. I was by no means certain a final assault would come tonight, but if it did, the command bunker would be a significantly unhealthy place to be. I have no doubt that the Tecrono sorcery of the Tau would have pinpointed it to the millimeter, and that 
was top of the list to visit from one of the strike teams. Good morning, sir. Jürgen Ass, materializing from the shadows of his unique and earthy aroma, greeting me a good three seconds before he had time to open his mouth. I've had better, I admitted, with more candor than I normally employ. But Jürgen had served with me long now, for about seventy years by that point, saving my miserable hide more often than either of us could count and I owed him as much honesty as I ever gave anyone. Our brief exchange was punctuated by heavy weapon discharges flickering in the distance like gathering storm, lacerating the grey overcast of early evening stark against the red tin sky. Not all the red was due to the sunset either. Hablocks were ablaze in a dozen places throughout the beleaguered city, Unfortunately, the firestorms hampered our movements as much as the tow. If not more so, the Zeniths were able to hop about in their anti-gravic vehicles pretty much as they wished, instead of having to grind their way along the brosy cleared roads like our Chimeras and even Russes were favored to do so. Only to end up in the middle of an ambush as like a knot. Dinner, sir, Jürgen said, producing a flask from somewhere along the triangle of webbing he had happily fastened with. And I took it gratefully. The evenings were chill here in the equatorial mountains, where the capital had been founded. Although why they hadn't put it somewhere a little more clement was beyond me. Thank you, I said sipping the fragrant beverage and savouring the tendril of warmth which oozed its way down into my stomach. Hmm, <clears throat> shall we go? Ready whenever you are, sir, my aide assured me, scrambling into the driver's seat of the salamander we requisitioned from the transport pool. Shortly after our arrival, the engine was grumbling quietly to itself already. Jürgen began... Far too seasoned a veteran to risk even the second or two delay that firing it up would take it, if we were caught flat-footed this close to a combat zone. I clambered into the passenger compartment, returning the salutes of a squad of guardsmen double-timing it past us in the direction of the main gate as I did so. With reflexes honed by decades of exposure to Jürgen's robust driving style, I grabbed at the pendulum mount for support an instant before we jerked into motion. It was as well as that I did, for in regaining my balance, my eyes drifted skywards. Black shapes were moving above the buildings and finding light, had now rendered to stark edge silhouettes etched against the crimson glow. The gracefully sinister curvature of the surfaces betrayed their origin unmistakably. Incoming! I voxed, opening fire with a storm bolter as I did so, quietly cursing my luck. The attack I anticipated, and come close to avoiding, had arrived. Editorial Note it will hardly come as a surprise to most of my readers that, and listeners, beyond a few delusionary complaints about the air temperature, Kane says little about Cordenvillier itself. The following extracts may go some way towards ridimating this, this deficiency. From Interesting Places and Tedious People, The Wanderer's Way Book, by... Yovel Skirka. 145 M39. Quadrivia will be a familiar destination for most seasoned travelers in and around the Desmos Gulf, since it was a great good fortune to be situated at the confluence of no fewer than four warp currents of unusual swiftness and stability. Unsurprisingly, 
therefore, this is a world, or, to be more precise, an entire planetary system, which tends to be passed through rather than visited. Indeed, it is quite possible to transfer between vessels aboard one of the many orbital docks and void stations which ring it without ever setting foot on a planet at all. Nevertheless, it could be worth breaking a longer journey here for a prolonged skewism, or even making it the intended destination of an indefinite stay. Though it's true to say that, at first sight, the principal cities around the equator offer little to the discriminating wayfare consisting, as they do almost entirely, of starport facilities. The vulgar commercial institutions deemed necessary by those engaged in trade, and the habitations of the artisan class, apparently required in depressingly high numbers to ensure the efficient running of both. Peak Haven is gratifyingly cosmopolitan as any planetary capital in this region of space. Set high in the mountain range, with sprawls along the equator, biscuiting the western content, its streets and avenues cling to the sides of peak and valley alike, the highest ramparts of which wall off the worst of the noise and bustle of the starport. This is thus confined to a broad disposition. Some three or four kilometers across, surrounded by higher mountains, it goes without saying that lodging should be sought on the other wall of the rim, since the intervening mass of granite effectively muffles most of the sound of the constant shuffle traffic. The sight of this is quite spectacular, however, partially at night, when the engine glows make a constant vortex of light in the darkness, like the sparks above the forge. Smaller towns and village are, of course, to be found elsewhere on the two continents, but contain little of interest. In the Crusade and After, A Military History of the Dominicus Gulf by Vargo Royce 058-M42 Wait a second, this is after the Crusade. From the Crusade and After so this is during the Indominus Crusade. Got it. Though checked by the first confrontation with the Imperium's might, the expectionist ambitions of the Tau were far from blunted. The next two hundred years were marked by periodic clashes between the two powers, as frontier worlds were annexed, deafened and reclaimed, and in many cases, lost again. Indeed, Simplexia was to change hands seven times in all, before ultimately being lost to both sides as the outliers of the High Fleet Kraken smashed into the eastern arm, although such a case was essential for the most part. What the Tau gained for subterfuge for the force of arms they kept, although the Imperium made them pay a heavy price, and weren't even able to claim some notable success of their own such as the reclamation of Gudovics in 931. Had the forces of the Emperor had been able to concentrate their full might on the upstart upsos, things would have been very difficult, and different, of course. Things would have been very different, of course. But the last quarter of M41 was riven with conflict on every front to the ever-present menace of the orcs and the failed designs of the traitor legions was added to the gradual awakening of the necrons, who began to attack human outposts in the ever-increasing numbers, while the Eldar continued their partial raids seemingly at will. Perhaps fortunately the Tau, too, were beginning to fall foul of these enemies, and others more and more frequently as their sphere of influence expanded preventing them from engaging an all-out intervention of Imperial space. The stalemate was eventually broken in 992, 
when the Tau fleet striking deep inside the Imperial border appealed in orbit around Cordenvillia, rapidly overwhelming the planetary defenses and landing an invasion force. Once in entrusted control, denying Imperial access to the vital warp currents which flowed together there, they would have effectively blockaded eight of the disputed systems in the border region, cutting them off from reinforcement and leaving them free to be picked off at their leisure. Fortunately for these Imperial worlds, the second relief expansion was led by Kaifus Cain. The renowned Commissar, who had been so instrumental to Fu, foiling the Tau designs on Gevlax, and was to prove more than equal to his fresh and more urgent threat to the Imperial interest. Chapter 2 Whatever the warning I gave made any difference, I couldn't say. But mine wasn't the only finger on a trigger. As the first wave of the tower assault burst over the jagged wreath of the airstrike shattered buildings surrounding the compound, and which had masked their approach from the direction by our auspexes. Rugged small arms fire sparked and popped against the smooth rounded armor of the troop carriers circling above our heads, and the bright streaks of a rocket from a man portable launcher slashed at the sky for a moment before detonating against one of the blocky engine pods attached to the rear of the closets. The devilfish lurched and pulled up, aborting its descent, but the respite were short lived, a pair of Platter-like drones detached themselves from the hull almost at once and swooped in search of vengeance. Plasma rounds from the guns mounted beneath them, bursting around the sandbagged emplacement from which the rockets had come. Now the guardsmen crouched within it, feared against the unexpected attack I never saw. There were a flurry of las rounds replied with considerable accuracy. For by that time, my attention was intimately taken up with a matter of my own survival. The salamander lurched as Jürgen made a hard turn to evade a carrier gorged into the rock crate ahead of us by a far bigger plasma burst from the main gun of another circling troop carrier, and I suddenly found a small, fast-moving shadow drifting across my sights. The storm bolter bucked against its mount as I squeezed the trigger reflexively, stitching a row of impact craters along the belly of a skimmer which screamed overhead, low enough for the backwash of its passing to snatch the cap from my head. I must have found a weak spot for almost at once. Smoke began to seep from the starboard engine and it flipped over, ploughing into the ground. It kept going on pure momentum, raising a bow wave of pulverized rock rate and smearing its lackless crew along the hard surface as it did so, before coming to a rest embedded in the wall of an officer's mess. Ouch, I said feelingly. They were asking for it. Jürgen opened, triggering the forward flamer and emulating a couple of swooping gun drones before they had a chance to open fire on us in return. What sort of idiot flies around with an open cockpit in the middle of a firefight? <laughs> Good point, I said, ducking behind the thick armor plate, as debris from the nearby explosion rattled against it. One of the hydra's spitting streams of tracer rounds at the descending invaders had just taken a direct hit. The intense heat of the tower plasma bolt cooking off its ammunition, and a section of a hull plating whirled through the space, and just vacated. If I hadn't ducked when I did, it would have taken off my head. Putting my cap in the bottom of the passenger, well, I jammed it back on, my head as firmly as possible, feeling that I might as well look the part and peer cautiously over the rim of the armored compartment. We were the only Imperial vehicle still moving through the blizzard of descending fire. 
Although Lehman Russ, with its track blown off, was traversing its turrets, scanning hopefully for a target, and the crew were bailing out of a second Hydra, which had no turret left at all that I could see. Clearly the Tau had prioritized the targets more capable of hammering them, although I had no doubt that they had got around to picking off our lightly armored salamander before long. Get us under cover, I ordered, despite being pretty sure Jürgen would have worked that out for himself by now. Right you are, sir, he acknowledged, and spun the vehicle on a coin, slamming the right-hand track into reverse with a speed which elicited an alarming sound from the gearbox, although that would have been as nothing compared to the fuss any of our engine seers would have made if they'd been around to hear it. Once again, I clung to the pintle mount for support, while we took off in a completely different direction, plasma bolts boiling into the rock crate where we would have been if Jürgen hadn't swung us about. The first of the attacking troop carriers hit the ground about a hundred meters ahead, its shock absorbers flexing against the rock crate even before they fully extended again. The boarding ramp dropped. Instantly, another pair of lethal drones soared into the air to provide fire support for the Pathfinder squad disembarking from it. The Xenos moved with remarkable agility despite the body armor that they were encased in. Their faces rendered curiously in sectile by the glowing red lenses embedded in their faceplates. Underrated, I opened fire on the warriors and vehicle alike. Scything a hail of bolt rounds through the air they occupied. A couple of the compact plasma bolts from the ground troopers' carbines burst against the armor surrounding me in reply, gouging deep craters in the sedamite. But it held. Then a solid armor piercing projectile slammed right through the passenger compartment, punching holes in both sides. I could have pushed my fist through. One of them's got a rail rifle, I shouted to Jürgen, although the noise of the engine and the firefight surrounding us meant that he could only hear the me over the Vox link anyway, so there was little point in raising my voice. I tried to depress the storm bolter to engage the ground troops, but a piece of debris from the exploding hydra was jammed in the pintle, and I couldn't sling it down far enough. Frack! I'm on it! Jürgen assured me and triggered the flamer again, adding a burst from the whole mounted heavy bolter for good measure, and the Pathfinder squad scattered from the grout of blazing Prometheum, which tows up inside the transport through the still open passenger ramp. That'll give him something to think about. It certainly did a moment later. The upper hatches popped and the crew bailed out becoming easy targets for the vengeful las gunfire of those guardsmen still in the fight. At this point, I began to hope that the balance might tilt the other way. The Tau had a definite edge when it came to long-range shooting, but they had no stomach for getting up close and personal, while well, the guard had no such combs. In fact, the death warriors making up the majority of the garrison here seemed to prefer it. Wading in with bayonet and lazar for but at every opportunity, their orc hide capes swirling about them with almost as much ferocity energy as they were still attached to their original owners. Which didn't mean they fought with all the finesse and technical sense of a core knight berserker. Quite the contrary. Where they came from, survival meant issuing their wits as well as their weapons. All units, pull back. General Paddock voxed. It wasn't time to rein them in. Defend the bunker. I couldn't fault his tactics. Our priority was clearly to deny the Tau their objective. But from where I was standing, or more accurately, rotting around like a pea in a can, we just handed them the initiative again. Hold on, sir. Jürgen urged, triggering the forward-mounted heavy bolter again. Another sleek and deadly troop carrier was drifting in front out of the darkness above our heads, cutting across our path as the pilot brought it in to land. 
The explosive bolts chewed away at the whole armor, doing little damage that I could see. But at the very least, we must have startled the crew as the devilfish grounded hard, buckling its lander gear. Although I found myself vindictively hoping we'd done a great deal worse than that. The shock of the impact had clearly come as an unwelcome surprise to the passengers, too. Instead of disembarking in a good order, securing the boarding ramp as they went, they boiled out as though abandoning the vehicle. And I was pleased to note that at least a couple of them were limping. The semi-handler jerked violently as Jürgen swung it around to keep the weapons bearing for as long as he could. Oops. <laughs> Oops indeed, I agreed, hanging on for dear life as my aid kept us lurching from left to right in an attempt to evade as much of the incoming fire from the Xenos as he could, or possibly run a few of the stragglers down. It was hard to be sure which, as I was more than a little preoccupied with trying to remain on my feet. Mindful that there were probably a few guardsmen still around to tardy or sensible to have rejoined Braddock in the middle of the closing ramp and that I had a reputation to live up to. I squeezed off a few rounds from the storm bolter, too. I failed to hit any of the scattering pathfinders, the explosive projectiles simply hissing over their heads due to the damaged pintle mount. But I was surely, uh, pretty sure, I put them off their aim, at least. Some good cover over there, Nogan said, doggedly stickling to the last order I'd given him and completely disregarding Braddock's, which was fine by me. Another burst from both heavy and storm bolters was enough to shred the sighted fins, which, in happier times, was supposed to keep lowly civilians from trespassing on hollowed rockcrete of the guard garrison. And with a lurch, which almost broke my spine, we bounced over the mercenary footings and onto the road beyond. Our gallant salamander's tracks bit deep into the surface of the carriageway, separating the perimeter of the barracks from an abandoned industrial facility. And Jürgen rammed a throttle lever as far forward as it would go. That smelting plant still standing, mostly. Keep going, I said. Now that we were clear of the combat zone, I saw no realization to linger become a footnote in Braddock's last stand. Come on, Arcane. Respond. The general's voice echoed in my combeat, as if in reproach to that fleeting thought. Are you there? We're cut off from the bunker, I told him, truthfully enough, as it would have been suicide to try fighting our way back in through the rapidly deploying towel. The Xenos have it completely surrounded, which may have been a slight exaggeration, but if it wasn't true by then, it soon would be. The preferred tactic, when faced with a strategic defense position, was always to surround it, relying on the superior range and firepower of their weapons to wear down the defenders. The bloody business of actually taking an objective, they preferred to palm off on their crute vessels. Which I could hardly blame them for, especially as the crute seemed to enjoy that kind of thing. I'm going to head for the southern enclave and try to pull some effectives together before it's too late. Most of the units had left were concentrated in the southern quarter of the city, which made it the best place to be so far as I was concerned. The more bodies I could put between me and the Tau, the better. With a bit of luck, we'd be able to hold out long enough for Zevin's task force to turn up and evacuate the survivors which I was determined, would include me. And in the worst come to the worst, it would be easy enough to go around on my own more or less indefinitely. I hadn't forgotten any of the lessons I'd learned, dodging orcs on Prelia, and the tower would be far less inclined to waste time and resources hunting down stragglers who didn't do anything stupid enough to attract their attention like shooting at them or blowing things up. Then the greenskins had been. Good idea, Braddock said, 
clearly believing that the situation meant I'd be bringing a relieving force back with me. Just hold out as long as you can, I walked back, not having the heart to debase him. And sure, he'd do that anyway, whatever I said. Damn purpose, X. Not so far as I could see. He was going to have his work cut out for him, keeping Braddock in one piece for much longer. Come to that, he didn't seem to be doing that good of a job for me either. Shadows were moving at the end of the street, too quick and fluid to identify, but some of them seemed uncomfortably big. All of a sudden, an abandoned smeltery looked a good deal more attractive than it had done. But it was far too late to worry about that. Whatever was lurking up the boulevard would have registered our approach by now, and be locking its weapons on our auspex trace. As like as not. Hit the lights, I told Jürgen, wrestling with the damaged pintle mount again. Once more to no avail. Nothing was going to free the mechanism sort of benedictions of a tech priest. And there's never one around when you actually need one. Right you are, sir, my aide responded, and I squinted reflectively as the power spotlight kindled, the beam knifing erratically through the darkness in response to every jolt of our absurd suspension. Then... The breath seemed to solidify my lungs as a dancing ray of light picked out a cluster of vaguely humanoid forms, more than twice the height of a man. Dreadnoughts, or the Tau equivalent at any rate. Just as heavily armed as their Imperial counterparts, and a lot more maneuverable. Second wave's incoming, I vox a braddock. If I was about to die, I suppose I might as well be remembered for some heroic last words. I'll delay them as long as I can. Which wasn't likely to be more than a second or two, especially as I hadn't actually said anything about trying to engage the towering battlesuits in combat. Attracting their attention just long enough for them to be sure I was heading for the horizon, and not worth wasting the ammo on, would be good enough for me. Can you give us an estimate on the numbers and disposition? Barrick asked, determined to get his currency's worth out of my noble sacrifice, and I gritted my teeth. Clearly, Lotson, surely, wasn't going to be an acceptable answer. Thorn alone knew who might be monitoring the Vox traffic, and if by some miracle I did get out of this with a whole skin, the last thing I needed was an auditory record of me appearing to panic and run for it, popping up in time to prevent me from enjoying the benefits of another boost to my fraudulent reputation. Not that I have anything against panicking and running for it. <laughs> On the controversy, it worked for me every time. The trick is to do so and not let anyone else realize what's you're actually doing. Otherwise, you'll have to... Well, you'll have all that tedious business of tribunals and potential firing squads to put up with afterwards. <laughs> um, yes. Wait one, I said, hoping to buy a little time and hopping even more frequently that the next sound of the Vox record wasn't going to be omnibus burst of static followed by silence. I gestured to Jürgen. Get us off the street! Very good, sir. He responded as phlegmatically as ever, and swung the vehicle hard over. A railgun round howled through the space we just vacated, the sonic boom of his passage shaking the air and making the sentimental rock on its suspension. I ducked as he took us through the side of a warehouse without bothering to look for the door. The wall exploding around us in a shower of scattered brick as he rammed his way through it. Battle suits, I told Braddock, protecting my head from a blizzard of masonry as best as I could, while Jürgen carried on demolishing interior walls in our headlong dash towards some semblance of safety. 
The searchlight beam had swept across the whole crisis team just before they opened fire, and I tried to recall what I'd seen in as much detail as possible, which wasn't much, if I'm honest. I've been too busy ducking. A full squad, but there are probably more behind. At least I thought I'd seen three of them, but they were hellish fast and agile, and in the dark it was hard to be sure. They got rail guns, I added, as an afterthought. At least, the one which had shot us it did, and I wasn't about to go back and look for the rest. So we haven't got long, Barter concluded remarkably calmly after the circumstances. We both knew that the hypervelocity projectiles would punch through the reinforced fiddle crate, like Jürgen devouring a pack of crackers, with an equal amount of scattered debris. I think we've shaken them, sir, Jürgen said, giving me some good news at last. Ramming a large wooden cargo door as he spoke, we plummeted about a meter from a raised loading dock, not even slowing, or... Our spinning tread slammed into the rock-crated yard in a sharp burst of pervulsed gravel. The salamander's floor shot up to punch me in the face, driving the breath from my lungs, and I tasted blood. When my teeth had lacerated the inside of my cheek. <coughs> Good! I gasped, feeling the relatively minor discomfort of a small price to pay for our deliverance. But of course, I was speaking too soon. Hardly in a stagger to my feet again, leaning on the much-abused pintle mount for support, then one of the following tower's battle suits landed in front of us, shaking the ground with the impact of its arrival. My elevated perch in the rear of the salamander brought my head almost level with the pilot's and I flinched as a targeting beacon swept across my face, blinding me for a moment. Hang on, sir, Jürgen called, as though I'd been doing anything else for the last ten minutes, and triggered the weapon mounts. A hail of bolter rounds and a ghost of Prometheum roared towards the giant warrior, but the pilot triggered its jump jets at the last possible instant, and it hopped remarkably over the devastating barrage, like a child with a skipping rope. Blinked, my dazzled eyes clear, I tried to track the soaring silhouette with the storm bolter, but the mounting had seized up entirely by the time, which I suppose had hardly surprising given the battering it had taken. Then I took in the battlesuit's trajectory with incurious horror, Jürgen, I yelled. Jump! Situating the action to the word, I scrambled out of the passenger compartments and leapt for my life, praying the throne to grant me a soft landing. I didn't get one, of course. The emperor having more urgent business as usual. But Jürgen had slammed on the brakes to avoid colliding with our towering assailant, no doubt appreciating that the impact would break our necks however much damage it did to the battlesuit. So at least we were moving a lot slower than it had been. I struck the rockcrete of the yard, no harder than required to crack a rib or two. It was uncomfortable enough, but I had it worse, and felt that if I was well enough to complain about it, I'd got off pretty lightly, all told. An instant after I hit, the Tau Dreadnought landed securely on top of the salamander, crushing it into the rock crate with a squeal of rending metal, as though it had been no more robust than a cardboard box. Rivlets of Prometheum gushed from the ruptured fuel and flamer tanks, spreading out around the crippled vehicle like blood from mortal wounds. Jürgen, where are you? I called. Over here, sir. My aid rolled to a sitting position half hidden in the shadow of a wall of a dozen meters away, and tried to hold myself upright, one hand pressed to the side of his head. I'll be all right. Right with it. Then his knees folded, and he slithered back down on his haunches. A dark stain was visible beneath his fingers, which, admittedly, was nothing new, but this one was spreading slowly. 
It had not been for his helmet, the impact of the landing would probably have crushed his skull. Stay down, I called to him, as though either of us had any choice in the matter. Just got to see off the pile of unsatisfied scrap. Then we'll get you to the Medicaid. And right after that, I added under my breath, the Necrons will take up flower arranging. I tapped where my comm bead should have been, hoping to summon help, but just got an earful of finger from my pains. Somewhere along the way, the tiny Vox unit and I had parted company. We were on our own. The Tau Battlesuit stepped back off the mashed remains of the expiring salamander with one foot, leaving the other where it was, looking all for the world, like a beast hunter with a trophy, posing for a pict. Its head turned, scanning the yard, and I looked around frantically for some visage or cover, only to find there wasn't one. I was surrounded by nothing but bare rock rate, a sitting target. I scrabbled for my sidearms, feeling better for the weight of the chainsaw in my hand, even though against the heavily armored battle suit, it would be worse than useless. Then the acid odor of spilled Prometheum stretched my nostrils, and a desperate idea began to blossom. Foodalized by panic, the last pistol in my other hand would barely scratch the thing's paint. But... The looming figure raised an arm, a vicious-looking rotary cannon, swinging towards me. Even a single round from it would be enough to vaporize me where I stood. With no more time to think, I pulled the last pistol's trigger. My aim was true. The last bolt sparking off a sundered metal of the salamander, although by this time there was so much promethium vapor in the air it hardly mattered where the round impacted. It detonated at once, a fireball boiling out from the wreck in all directions, close enough to shrivel my eyebrows. A wall of furnace heat arrived with a shockwave slamming me back to the ground and sending my chain sword skittering off to the shadows. I hung on to the last pistol, though. The augmented fingers of my right hand slowed to relinquish their grip, for which I was suitably grateful. For a moment, I dared to hope that my desperate gamble had paid off, and that the battle suit had been immosolated in the explosion, or at the very least damaged enough to discourage a pilot from pursuing us. But of course, I reckoned without the jump jets, they kicked in at once, allowing the huge machine to ride the shockwave in a single bolitic leap, with no more ill effects than a faint charring around the ankles. I clambered to my feet once more, only to stagger again as the battle suit crashed back to earth. This time I remained standing, however my footing rendered no more usable than during a typical drive with Jürgen. As the armored giant plodded relentlessly towards me, shaking the ground with every stride, raising my last pistol. I sent a desperate few ricochets bouncing off the torso plates, but didn't even manage to slow the thing. Then, by the light of the burning salamander, I finally saw a way out of the trap. A second loading door further down the wall of the warehouse. This time at ground level. Without another thought, I sprinted for it. But before I could get anywhere close to the corrugated metal steel, bulged and tore, ripped aside by another of the towering machines as though it was no more substantial than a curtain. It, too, began to plod unhurringly towards me and I retreated a few paces, firing as I went. But for all the effect I was having, I might as well just have been throwing feathers at it. After a dozen or so steps, I stumbled against something, yielding and almost fell, being brought up short by the stout masonry wall behind it, as a familiar odor assaulted my nostrils. Run for it, sir. Don't mind me. Jürgen slurred, already halfway to unconsciousness. Not an option, I assured him, certain that by now escape was impossible. I raised my hands and let the last pistol drop to the rock crate. Perhaps they wouldn't just gun us down out ahead. If they thought we were harmless, at least we weren't dealing with vicious brutes like the orcs or refined sadists like the Eldar ravers, in whose hands we'd far better off dead anyways. Then the targeting beam swept my face again, and I flinched, cursing, 
wishing I'd taken to go with fighting after all. At least that would have left me with an illusion of possible escape right up to the end. Instead of the crushing certainty of imminent ignoramus butchery, I braced myself hoping the Emperor would be good mood when I arrived at the Golden Throne, or at least willing to listen to excuses. Are you Kamazar Kaifis King? Hero. A voice asks, in halting Gothic. The curious lisping accent of the Tau amplified by external Vox system somewhere on the battle suit facing me. I am, I said, fighting to keep a sudden flare of hope from inflicting my voice. If they wanted to talk, they weren't going to pull the trigger right away, although I was damned if I could see that we had anything to discuss. And you are? Ui Thi Sheng, and the Shu Yui Kasui. In the name of the greater good, we ask of you to convey a message to your fellows. Better and better. They clearly weren't about to shoot the messenger. I had to hope Braddock didn't either. What message would that be? I asked, not wanting to seem too eager. For all I know, they were recording this, and the last thing I needed was to be excused of collaborating with the enemy to save my own neck. We wish the negotiation of truce. The Tal told me, as though that were the reasonable thing in the galaxy, just as they were about to snatch the entire planet out of under us regardless. A truce, I repeated, not entirely willing to trust my own ears. Are you sure? Completely, the amplified voice assured me. Hostilities must cease at once on this world. The greater good demands it for both of our empires. All right, I got to say up front that I am sorry for not having as many sound effects in the background for this one. I just wanted to get this one out to you guys as fast as possible. I was not expecting the greater good to have Tao wishing to <laughs> say we're no longer going to fight even though we're going to win the war. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting book. I can already tell. I've never read this one except for before I decided to read it for the audio recording, of course. So honestly, I have no idea what's going to happen next. Anyways, I have been horribly sick, so I haven't been able to do anything for a whole week, and I am completely sorry about that. Thank you for understanding and taking time to understand and to go like, oh, he's sick. Let's give him a week to get his bearings back in order. And so here we are just in time for Christmas, Hanukkah, and any other type of holiday that you celebrate around this time of the year in December when this video is being released. Hope you all have a wonderful holiday, including the Patreon supporters of the channel. Mr. Crossman123, Kokoa, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldrick Maldred, Fortress Unum, Daskowski was right. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon supporters of the channel and helping the channel stay afloat and going on no matter what. No matter what YouTube throws at us, no matter what they try to do, the Patreon supporters will always be there to help. And if you want to be a Patreon supporter of the channel and have your name read out at the end of these videos, you can too in the link in the description down below. And if you can't use Patreon, we also have Venmo <coughs> and the other thing down in the description down below. Just in case you can't use Patreon for whatever reason, and if you want to still help support the channel and be a net name on this list, you can do it there. Once a month, whenever you feel like it. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you, and thank you for watching another one of these videos. I cannot wait to see you in the next one. Stay safe out there, and have a great time this holiday. Uh, if you're listening to it around the time the video is actually released, otherwise afterwards, have fun with your friends and family, do whatever you can in life, and stay happy out there. And stay safe. <laughs> I'll see you in the next one. Until then. Bye-bye.